All right, it's a fantastic day to be back. Today we have a very special guest. My name is Charbel Milan. Today we got Lucas. Lucas. We have Lucas in the building, the producer, founder, and ultimately inspired distraction himself. Am I right? Well, they call me Dr. Distracted. Dr. Distracted. <laughs> I, you know what? I actually, I agree with that. I, I see what they mean by that, right? But it's a good thing, though. Yeah. It's good to be distracted on important topics, right? I, I think so. It's kind of interesting how we're often told to avoid distraction. Um, but I like to think about it in terms of what if that distraction leads us to something great. So, you know, I'm definitely a believer in following your gut following what you feel and good things are going to happen hell yeah man so no, before we really get going yeah is there anything you know how we do it right is there anything people need to know about you to not only put them in the right mindset but just to kind of fill in any blanks that they would have if they didn't know yes yeah, uh we'll just give you the the sob story right off the bat let's you get know, it uh raised in a single parent household uh you know, a lot of, lot of instability, uh, high school dropout, um, you know, but I made a turnaround. I made the comeback. You can Google me, Lucas Lester. There's a whole article about it. Uh, and yeah, so I'm not, you know, I wasn't handed anything necessarily. Right. So Hell that yeah. might be good to start there. Hell yeah, why not? So we were talking earlier, and I feel like we should get the people up to speed on some of the things you were going through that ultimately led you to start your starting your own podcast, right. led us to getting in touch, letting us to, you know, do this episode. For anyone watching, I'm about to do an episode on Inspired Distraction after this. So we'll definitely put a link in the description for that. Oh, hell yeah. But um, yeah, so what are some of the things that you got out of growing up in a single parent home, growing up feeling like you didn't have a good hand of cards or whatever the situation is. Right. What what is what is there about that that you felt like ultimately got you to where you failed at a lot of things, you learned and now you bounced back. So if you just want to give them the rundown on those things that I'm even talking about. Right. So essentially during the time it was not, I didn't feel as though I was growing up hard or, you know, I had the, the deck against, you know, I had the odds against me or anything like that. But it's more so in retrospect that I look back and I realize, okay, maybe the reason I was unable to stay committed to things and finish what I started has to do with the instability that I was witnessing uh, throughout my upbringing. And it's, it's no slight to my mother at all. She was doing the best she could. Yeah. But of course there, there's a limit to what one person can do to, to raise and, and take care of, uh, two other people who have their own, uh, you know, their own idea of what they want to do. And so I definitely like, it wasn't, it was never something I, I used or, and I, and I don't even like to necessarily define myself as that, like this person who had a crutch and, um, like, but, you know, now that I'm a little older and I can look at it from a different perspective, you know, I realized that Perfect. those things absolutely, they, they played a role. And, you know, it was like, I didn't have the role, I believe, at least based off of what I've experienced, I believe that each, everybody needs a positive male and female role model to consistently, uh, like, Nurture, show us the way. Almost, I, yeah, yeah I mean, mentor, just, mentor. Just to consistently be that example. Okay. Right, and, and yes, mentor, but it's something about, I think, just it's got to be a day in, day out type of thing. And there's got to be structure. And when there is just, if there's not enough of it, you know, you fucking, you take the long and hard road like I have. And so 
you know, but I, I'm I'm grateful for it, obviously, because I know that like everything's not fair, everything's not equal, and like you can't just justify away things and act like everything's okay because your life's all right. Like there's other people who are going through shit and if you haven't been through some level of fucking uh, adversity, then it can be very easy, I think, to just, you know, kind of justify why somebody's in the situation they're in. Oh, they put themselves there. And it's really easy to not look back and think about the experiences and the different situations that led them to where they're at at that point. So... So you're like a believer in um, you you need to it takes a good it takes a it takes a bad time to know a good time or no that's not what it was, the um ah oh God I can't think of it right now but pretty much the whole idea that hold on I'm gonna go kill my cat real quick oh uh, this should be fine okay I won't kill him today. yeah screw him right? not on this we'll episode. let him <laughs> live another day but pretty much the concept that. You got to struggle to understand not only where you've come and how far you've come, but to understand what you, what you have is what you're trying to say, like as a blessing. Yeah, I mean, it definitely increases the awareness of the blessings that that I do have. I will say that. And more importantly, I think, and it kind of, it, I think this is what led me to want to do a podcast. It's the fact that every single person has a story. Every single person is not just like what we see on the surface. And so I love to have conversations like this to get to know people and to get to know how the fuck they got to be right in front of me and having a conversation. Like right. what led up to this right here? Because there's a lot. You know, obviously the older we get, the more the, the more experiences, the more stories that we have to explain who we are. So it's definitely... Do you think that people are missing out on that? That people are messing up a lot of relationships, uh, not getting into some good relationships, and ultimately not really evaluating the people in their life correctly because they're not looking at the sociology behind why. Why is this person interacting with me this way? What's causing this person to feel this way, say such a thing towards me? Do you think that that's a field that a lot of people not necessarily are missing, but aren't giving enough importance towards? Do you think a lot of problems could be solved by just looking deeper as to why? Why is this person yelling at me? Why is my girlfriend tripping out at me? Why can't this person see my side of it? Yeah, I think absolutely. If we're not willing to take the time and really think about why, like, because I do believe, I mean, if somebody's evil, maybe they're just evil, right? And then again, you could even go as far to say as, well, there's a reason, right? There's something that led to that evil way of being that they have. But for the most part, I like to think that most of us are good people. We have good intentions and we want to do good. And we don't want to upset anybody. We don't want to hurt anybody. We're just doing the best we can. But it's the way we communicate. It's basically how we talk and respond and you know, have uh, our relationship, our relationships are definitely tied to the way we communicate with somebody. And if we, it's easy to communicate in a way that's not representative of how you really feel or how you really intend to come across. So, I mean, I do it. It's like, I think we all have triggers where if somebody says something to us a certain way, if they say a certain thing, like we kind of, I don't want to say black out because we know what we're doing. We're there in the moment, but we just say some shit and then we look and we're like, you know, maybe 30 minutes later, we're like, what the fuck? Why would I have said that? And so unless we're really reflecting and, and we have to give other people the credit too and realize they're human and they do just like I do nobody's perfect and nobody can say the right things at the right time in the right way to make me feel excellent you know every single time that I ask a question or I make a statement 
so yeah, I believe if we're gonna if we're gonna have a relationship with somebody, then we need to be willing to take all that comes with it and just know that people are good people. Like people are good. I don't care what they say on the news. It's just the way we communicate sometimes doesn't reflect that and it doesn't really convince others that we're good. I like that. No, oh, yeah. So from doing a podcast and you know meeting people, having guests on, would you say that sitting down and having long form conversation with somebody like we are right now, do you think it's ultimately enhance your ability to not only take that experience, right, and apply it in your everyday life, but ultimately, do you think it's enhanced your ability to communicate on a day-to-day basis just by being able to sit down like we are right now and just actually get to know someone? Do, do you think that when you're dealing with people out and about and you don't have the same amount of time to get to know them, are you saying that you try to think to yourself, well, I know that if I sat down with this person, eventually we'll find common ground? Absolutely. Yeah. And but sometimes we we get in our our groove and we're in a rush or we're doing what we're doing and we don't necessarily take the time to like really say okay well there's a reason they cut me off or there's a reason they flick me off when I cut them off and we just you know so yes i think this is definitely well, mm, I don't want to lie. Well, I don't think I've been doing it seen? long enough. What experience have you seen from the people you've had? Because, man, even if you've been doing it for a day, two days, it doesn't yeah. matter. You've been doing it. You've been living it. And I feel like there's value to be found. Yeah, so funny enough, so before I started the podcast, I think when I really got into this mindset of, like, I want to know who you are, like, with strangers, was uh, I was, you know, I was getting involved with student government, and I was doing my campaign which is ironic because you think of a campaign as like somebody just trying to like get votes. But what it turned into for me was I wanted to meet people and I wanted to get to know people. And so I did more getting to know people and finding out like the depth behind the mask before I even started this podcast. And so we're going to play this back. And notice that I say and so a lot. Maybe Hey, I say um, I feel like all the time. <laughs> I'm like I feel like. I think so. I feel like it's okay. It's interesting to see the things that you like the little ticks we have. Right. right. And you notice when you do this. So. Yeah, they're called uh I've been reading a lot about body language, reading body language. Mm. And I was reading this one book, right? So I I fucking hate reading. I swear to God, I hate it. But I force myself to do it because I love it. It's weird. That's a really weird relationship. I don't like reading, <laughs> but I love listening to audiobooks. Okay. But you're still reading, right? No, not. It's not? No. Really? Not, not mentally. Damn. Wow. I, but I, but I think it's it's good, though. Yeah, it's good. It's good enough <laughs> for me. Fuck it. It's better than not doing anything. Yeah, so I don't read, but I comprehend. Whatever you want to call it. I listen to a lot of audiobooks, and one of the things that they're talking about is that everybody has pacifiers. Everybody has something that they got to, whether it's how you say it. And I mean... As far as nonverbal communication, there's a lot that goes into it. But even with verbal communication, we all have like reference points. When you get nervous, when you feel like, oh, I'm going off topic, I'm going off beat. We all have mental things that we, we kind of like touch on to almost reset ourselves in a way. We don't realize it, but it's all good. But anyway, keep going. What was I saying? You're talking about student government and how you were campaigning and you were getting to know people, mm. but you weren't necessarily camp you weren't just trying to get votes you're actually trying to get to know people right so basically i wouldn't say it's through the podcast i think that's what even got me convinced that i could do a podcast is because i knew what it took to like genuinely just want to have a conversation and get to know somebody that i don't know and it taught me that everybody has a story and a lot of times people want to tell you their story People want to talk to you. They, nobody's coming up to them and saying, hey, talk to me. You know, at a place like State, where there's, you know, 20,000 maybe, like, on one campus at a time, it, it's hard. If you are if you don't know anybody else there, it can be difficult to get outside of your shell 
and just have a conversation with someone you don't know. And so there's, I think there's, I felt that way and I know I'm not the only one who's felt that way. So it absolutely became apparent to me that like we got to get to know people and we got to understand that it's, there's always normally an explanation for whatever we see. So how did that pr- prove to be effective? Because you said you did win, you were president, right? Right. So how did that eventually transition? Do you think that that's what gave you the edge? That you weren't just trying to get votes, you're actually trying to get to know people? Fix real problems that were happening on campus? Fix real issues in people's lives? Yeah, and it's funny you say that because that's what happens. Like When you start to have a conversation, you figure out how each individual feels about like for student government's purpose, we'll say how people feel about the school, right? And you can't, you can say, hey, can you vote for me? But if you don't figure out what they would even want to see different at the school or like how things can be improved to enhance their experience, then it's like, really, why would you, why would they want to vote for me if I can't even give them anything that they would want? or at least know what they want, right? It's like, so, yeah, I I don't want to say that, I think it's a combination of things, right? It's definitely, I think that helped, like being genuine and not just wanting to get votes. But I was also consistent, right? And like I set my goal and I I had a pretty good idea of what I had to do to reach it. And so it's the combination of, consistency and like just being genuine i think those those are pretty good life lessons be consistent be genuine hell yeah do do you think that's a problem that happens in real politics and real campaigns with you know like not even just trump but like whoever else is running right now like do you think they're not actually trying to get out there and find out okay yeah i want these people to vote for me but why? Why would these people choose me? Let me go out there, figure out what they need, and start pitching that during my campaign instead of just trying to rack up votes. Do you think that that's something people are missing out on? Or do you think the successful politicians are the ones that are using your strategy? That's a great question. I, I think it that may vary from person to person. Because on the outset, it seems like a lot of it's more of this person was in the right place at the right time. And it's at a certain level, it, it's more of a popularity contest who knows more people, right. And who's in the right party. Because again, it's especially in Georgia, right. If you're, if your district is not a majority Republican or, or majority Democrat, depending, you know, obviously we know very few, districts are uh, you know primarily democrat in georgia but like a lot of times it can just depend on if you're running in the right party it doesn't really matter who you talk to or what you say you're gonna do because the people going to the polls they know in their head like i'm not checking the box on republican or i'm not gonna check the box on democrat whoever's running it doesn't matter like i'm filling the ticket up on one side and so I think it would be nice if everybody did it. And I think maybe at some point they they figured out how to talk to people and how to get to know people. But I think with, with you know, high-level politics, it's more about people doing what I'm talking about, but they're selective with who they do it with. Okay. Like, you know... Who, I don't know shit about politics, man. Well, let's just that's say, why I never like shoot an opinion out there because I don't want to offend anyone when I don't even know what I'm talking about. That's fair. So for me, I, I do know a politician. Uh, he's a state representative. Won't say his name just to like avoid any whatever. Yeah, right. Of course. <laughs> and like I know the reason that he ran was because he was he was told basically by somebody you know uh the guy we had in for this district like 
maybe he just didn't want to run again or whatever the case was. And so the guy who's, he's still in office today, you know, he was told, Hey, I think you're the guy. And, and there was already a team like, because the guy who said, Hey, you're the guy he had, he had already developed all those relationships. And so it was basically, you know, finding a they, figure. They just had to find their spokesperson oh. for, 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 Basically, for their party. I mean, that's what it comes down to. It's like, this is it's our party. This is our district. And we want our district to be represented uh, with our party. So we're going to make sure we find the right person for the job. And so that's how this guy got into it. I'm not going to say that like, he wasn't genuine and he didn't figure out what people wanted. And like he's not trying to do good because I think he is. And so I don't want to take anything away from him in that aspect. But here's the thing he could have wanted to get to know all the people he wanted to but if he hadn't got the initial go ahead then i don't think i don't think it could have been possible okay because he didn't do any of the work well i mean, I mean he I, did but I, he didn't do the networking well yeah i mean i just think there's there's already a pretty firm system in place for a lot of political positions and there's not, unless you're on the inside already, as in, like, if you're not cool with the guy who knows all the other guys. Forget about it. If you're not cool with the guy that everybody else respects, maybe, then, yeah, yeah, it might be more difficult. But I think it's possible, especially with social media and, like, it's it's a different era. So I do believe anything's possible. So is that something that you encountered? Because I know you eventually became president, right? Right. So then what happened after that? After you you went into office? Yeah, well, and as we talked about, you know, it was at two different institutions. So the first one was a smaller school. And uh, my experience there was, it was really good. And at first, maybe there might have been a little bit of hesitancy. Uh, but when I say, you know, you have to be in the inner circle already. The inner circle wasn't so big that I couldn't prove that I was genuine, right? And so, you know, I worked hard and like I proved myself to them to where I gained their respect and everything worked out. Uh, then I moved to a different institution and it wasn't quite the same situation. And, well, we know how that ended up. Uh, they don't. They need to know. They need to know. So, you did become president, right? Still, I did two time, two time SGA president in the University System of Georgia, two different institutions. I don't know how often that's been done, but it hasn't been done a lot. So, uh, I'm proud of that. Proud. My pride is thankful. You should. <laughs> Hell yeah, that's a big achievement, man. Two yeah. different organizations, two different schools, two different networks, and you still became president at both. Right. Fuck. Yeah, it it's definitely different than real politics, like, but there's a lot of similarities, and so, I think. Oh, what happened? Oh yeah, what happened? I got impeached at the second institution. Granted, How long after? Yeah, let me let me be clear. It was a full year after I had taken my oath of office. Okay. So I and a term is one year. So I did serve my full term, but, you know. It ended with the mark of impeachment. So it That's weird. So you served your whole term, but they still were like, Yeah, you got impeached. Like you're not it's not that we don't want you again, you're actually impeached. Right. That's weird. Yeah. Well, uh, fuck them for that. I, that's kinda how I feel. Fuck them. Yeah. Because yeah. you they could have just been like they could have just been like, Well, you did your time and you know now we're gonna have someone else. We don't want you. Anything. But for them to actually impeach you, they yeah. all got together and voted to kick you out. Yeah, yeah. Huh. It's weird. It was, you know, definitely some personal animosity. Yeah, of course. That's what it always is. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. So, damn. It was so weird. I I hate that that happened. I didn't know that that's how it happened. Because I thought maybe it was a couple months in and then they tripped out and impeached you. But you served your whole term and then you got impeached. Yeah. It just yeah. seems like they, they, they wanted to leave a bad taste in your mouth. Oh, yeah, they did. Absolutely. They were pissed off that I was even... Cause, so, my vice president... His best friend, his roommate, 
was the guy who ran against me for oh, president. Oh, God. Yeah. So he had it out for me from the very beginning. Like, he was taking notes every chance he got when I was doing something that was out of line or out of character of a president. And, you know, he was just waiting for the chance and the opportunity to uh, to pull a, um, you know, a little a little dog and pony show like we're seeing it's actually taking place right now like in our actual government. Yeah. Right. Um, so he started to bring up a bunch of stuff about you to get you impeached when in reality, if he was just chilling, you could have just finished your term and moved on. Oh yeah. Yeah. We could have, I mean, I, there was, there was multiple people who kind of seconded that motion that look, the fuck it's the semester is over like his term's over what the fuck are we doing other than just doing some petty personal uh you know whatever whatever you want to call it no i feel that yeah so i feel that that was that and but that showed you that you knew how to properly interact with people enough to start a podcast because i mean let's be real man you infiltrated two social groups Right. right, and you, you, you rose to the office, and then even the second time, you still did your whole term, and then regardless of what happened, that led you to believe like, whoa, like I got it in me to get out there, meet people, like right now, you know, we didn't know each other until earlier today. Well, not really, because we had that live stream. But, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> hey, R.I.P. Kobe, but um, uh, tragic. Don't even. Yeah. Yeah, but so then. You ultimately segued that into starting a podcast. Yeah, yeah. So I'm like, you know, I'm, I guess I'm like anybody. I get distracted with YouTube. And so I'm always watching. I was watching Gary Vee a lot because the algorithm wanted me to watch him. Because <laughs> that's, that's what I would click on. And that's, you know, that's what showed up for me to watch. And I started to. Like a big thing he talks about is patience. So I had this whole idea of I'm going to go to law school, become a lawyer, and then I can start doing this media thing because I believed that like with a certain credential, that would just, that would give me a little bit more clout to leverage when it comes to interviews, when it comes to, uh, when it comes to having a YouTube channel and like promoting myself. I thought if I'm going to promote myself, because you know Gary Vee talks about like the 25-year-old life coach, right? Like you haven't fucking lived, but you're going to tell me how to live life. And so I didn't want to fall into I disagree that. with that. You do? I've never seen that. I would love to debate that with Gary Vee. You've never seen him say that? No, I would I would literally, I would love to sit across the room from Gary Vee in a table like this and debate that. Regardless of how much money he's made, I disagree with that. Well, maybe... Because you don't know what a person's gone through up until then, man. Especially yeah, me. I, I guess it depends on what you're trying to give advice on, right? Yeah, I guess, I guess, yeah, 100%. I mean, if it's life advice, I definitely think that by a certain point, like by 25, I think people have experienced... They've experienced enough to to help to an extent. I do think, I like, there's part of me that agrees with them that it takes a level of, like... There's just phases of life, right? There's that's true. You know, you there's adolescence, then there's kind of like this thing they're calling middle essence. I don't know if you've heard of that term yet. Yeah, yeah, I haven't. But it's it's a thing. It's like between adolescence and old age, right? And so we're still developing. I was just saying this last night. If you think about it, like someone who's wise is old. An old man is wise because he's he's been through pretty much everything you can go through as far as the phases of life. And so once you get past the, like, I go to school, I get a job, I get a wife and kids, and I, like, send my kids to school and all these things. Like, I think those are all key things to have experienced to give solid, sound advice. But it does depend, like, what are you giving advice on? Yeah, it does, man. And... I guess where it gets tricky is like if I'm giving somebody life advice that's going to 
maybe sway their decision on like where they're going to go to school or if they're going to go to school or if they're going to take this job or if they're not going to take this job. Like, and those are things that can have a, a huge impact. And I think if we're giving advice on things like that, but we haven't yet ourselves figured out what we're going to do or what our career is or like, you know what I'm saying? That for sure. It, it gets that tricky for sure. because it's like, how do I, I really can't tell you the best thing for you to do because for one, everybody's different. But for two, like, I don't even know what's best for me. So if I don't know what's best for me, how the hell could I tell you what's best for you? That's kind of where, and so I I was sticking to the script of, I'm going to stay committed. I'm going to finish the drill. You know, I'm going to do what I've got to do to get my law degree and like start my own firm. And then I'll have a story to tell when I am actually helping people. And I'll And they'll trust me because I have something to back it up. Like I'm not just talking shit because I think I'm smart or I think I've been through something like not only have I been through something, but I've been through something, overcame it, and went above and beyond what anybody thought I could do. So now I can tell you what you know what's probably the better choice. I I would feel more credible, confident. credible, credible, confident. Yeah, all those things. That was my mindset, and it, like I said, I'm still kind of a believer in that, but I just had to make a tough decision for myself that. You know, this this story that I was writing for myself, uh, at least for now, that's not going to be the way it goes. And that that was probably the toughest thing for me, you know, and I don't know if you have experienced anything like this, but when you tell enough people you're going to do something, uh, at some point you really, you feel like an obligation to uphold that, I guess, commitment or, or the, the promise that you made to people like, you know, this is my plan. And this is kind of how we're going to go about it. And then when you don't uphold that plan or you change plans, and I'm the type who's, I've been changing plans since it started. <laughs> like This is just uh, uh, one of many endeavors that I've kind of decided to go down. And so that it was, it was tough for me to accept like within myself that like it's okay if I don't go to law school and I don't become a lawyer, like I'm still the same person and like I can still do everything that I wanted to do regardless if I do that, right? But then I guess it, it's one of those things where how am I credible if I said I was going to do something and now I'm not doing it? So now every time I say I'm going to do something, it becomes... Well, yeah, but you said that about law school. You said that about being a teacher, right? You've said these things before. So, like, the credibility just becomes less and less each time I change my mind or I decide you know, that's not the path I'm going to go down. And so it's like, personally for me, that's been... uh something to to overcome and i like having this conversation like meeting new people like basically like i'm reinventing my story i'm 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 rewriting whatever i thought i had written like so this is you know chapter one of the new fucking story which is follow your heart follow your passions and don't let society and the world convince you that there's a right way and there's fucking something wrong with the way that I'm doing it. Like this is about, and I said it on the fucking podcast or, you know, when we were on the live stream, like everything's about love and it's about accepting everybody as they are and not judging them. Like we're all here experiencing life. Everybody's journey is different. Everybody's experience is different. But if you want to get fucking technical, like, it's the same shit. It's life. We all are doing the same thing. And we're all moving in different ways to, you know, come up with some sense of normal and to 
come up with some sense of right and wrong. But can I ask you a question? Go ahead. Sorry. Have you ever done psychedelics? No, I've got some acid in the top drawer. Never, I haven't tried it. Never tried psychedelics. Um, exactly what you just described is how I felt after. That it's all about love. No one knows what the fuck's going on. Everyone's just trying to figure out what their version of right is. It's just crazy how you just said all that. You know, it's funny because my buddy, the, the reason I have the acid in the top drawer, just kidding, police. No, no acid in the top drawer. It's in the bottom drawer. <laughs> So, like, you know, he's like, you got to try it. Your life will change. And I keep, and I always think, like, what the fuck more could I figure out? Like, the fact that I, like, Ooh. it's, you know, the base shit like that, I think, like, I don't, I hate to say it, I feel like I figured life out, but, but I'm not opposed. I've, I do want to, I want to try a, you know, I want to have the experience of that. If, for me personally, I would like, I've always said I wanted to use it as in, medicine spiritual medicine well that's how i use it i wanted to create art like oh, i wanted okay. to write a song or i wanted to do something while i was on that that could like i feel like that for me that would be the benefit it wouldn't be necessarily like answering life questions bro you're not getting but here's the thing all right <laughs> i have a very okay so i microdosed lsd for a month right and the way that you're supposed to do it I'm, this is all i'm gonna say my friend's idea was to have a podcast called The Microdose. Really? And we just get on and fucking trip and talk. But That's go. crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I would, I it would be that. like a microphone. Oh, wavelengths. Yeah. But anyway, um, so I did that for a month. And the way I did it was, you know, whenever I do shit, I have this weird thing where I like to do, I like to, I just love being connected. Like if we're going to get anything, a glass of water, I like to be able to get the best glass of water in the entire southeast like sorry about that oh no that's not what i mean <laughs> no i just mean like if i'm getting lsd i want to get the best shit that there is if i'm getting uh, mushrooms i'm gonna get a specific strain and i want to get the exact and i'm gonna get a test kit and i'm gonna that's just how i am because i like to know what i'm doing because i don't like to take like research chemical that kind of bullshit right right so what i did was i had so a, a, a usual tab has 100 to 150 ug of lsd right and so what UG, I did, was, what's UG? It's like a smaller than like, it's like a microgram or not like a micro, It'd be like microgram. It's, it's it's just a measurement like of how much, I, huh? Ultragram. Ultragram. That's probably exactly what it means. I don't know. I mean, yeah, you're talking about like, who knows? It's small shit. But anyway, so the, I got these psilocybin or not psilocybin, that's shrooms. I got these LSD liquid drops and each drop contained four UG. So mm -hmm. if you did two, three on the tongue. That's 12 UG. So think about it. 100 to 150 is a full tab. 12 is a microdose. So what you do is you do it every third day. You microdose, you know, for two days, do it that third day. I did that for a month. And the whole point is to do it for a month, then try to recreate the same feeling in your life the next month. Do it for one more month and then never do it again and stay on that positive grind. And I've been on that positive feeling for like two years, man. But anyway, I, I mean, up until now. So you, you stuck with that plan? And yeah, it, I stuck with that worked? plan. It was fantastic. It was, uh, dude, I studied for a final on microdosing LSD. I got a 94. Like, it just, it, it was weird. But here's the thing. It started to give me, like, it started to make me feel a little out of place. I started to con contemplate life too much. Like, what the fuck's going on? I started to be, like, soft towards life. Because mm -hmm. I was just like, you get in this mindset where like, we're all going to die. Why not? Who gives a shit? Like, just love all this stuff. But you kind of want to be a little more aggressive in the world to get somewhere. But the thing was, so, this thing with like, when you do it, man, it's just going to be like your whole thought process you're having. Imagine if you were to multiply that by like 100 and all those ideas are able to be comprehended at once in yeah. a way that makes you want to just run yourself into a wall because you don't have enough words coming out of your mouth fast enough to explain how you're feeling. Yeah, that's that's what that's kind of what I've heard. Like that's been the the common theme when people talk about it. Like, no, it's it's not it's like everything you just said, but in one second. <laughs> like yeah. and you feel it instantly. Like and it all makes sense and it's all comprehensible. Yeah. Which yeah, to my sober mind, that sounds interesting for sure. Uh but, you know, that feeling you were talking about of, like, 
come becoming soft to life what the fuck matters like all this shit you know before when i initially dropped out of high school and when i started uh, well when i wasn't doing shit basically except working and smoking weed and you know writing music and just like hanging out with friends that was the mindset i had i had this mindset of you know like we're all fucking animals we're all just trying to survive trying to do the best we can and like people get upset about like other people like you know parents get upset about their kids not behaving in a certain way or like there's always this judgment towards those we know and like we have some sort of expectation for them and i just felt like none of that was real it was all just like this bullshit that we have conjured up over time as a society because like we've we're so past the point of survival that we don't know what the fuck to think important is and so we all come up with our different ideas of what's important when really i was convinced and i still am convinced that like all we need to do is survive if we can figure out how to do that and do it well then what what does it matter if i'm not in school what does it matter if i don't have a job what does it matter if i just sit around and smoke weed all day right like unless it starts affecting me in a way that i don't like then i don't, I don't see why it should be that big of a deal but it's like you're saying there comes a point where there's like the line okay you can either be totally outcast and outside of society and live that way that we're talking about uh which you know like a monk or like a uh, whatever a shaman you know anybody who's who lives in the spiritual realm i think even to some extent being a preacher is is kind of taking that that leap of faith like you're 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 putting everything all you're putting all significance into spirituality and like the the journey to understand oneself and like the journey to just be good to others so it's just interesting like as much as i believe in like just being passive and living and like being spiritual and thinking about things deeply and being grateful being thankful that was the, it's so strange to me when i was in this place of like none of the shit that everybody thinks matters really matters like i was just i would find myself alone a lot of times but i i might be like in an open field i would have some space and i would just be so grateful and so thankful and i'd i'd come to tears just with gratitude of like the fucking life that i do have and like you know after of all the shit that i went through growing up whatever it was how bad or good it may have been like i never thought about any of those things i just thought about how grateful i was in that moment and like i just thought there was a lot of people around me who were taking a bunch of shit for granted and they weren't grateful they weren't showing gratitude and they're just stuck on the wheel like they're they're doing it's a good way to put it stuck on the wheel like they don't know what the fuck they're doing they're just doing what emotions right yeah just getting through the next day getting to that next paycheck no goal no plan you know i have slowly subconsciously distanced myself from all the people in my life that thought like that because they started to make me feel like I was weird because I had all these goals. I had timelines, dates, specific. I want to have this done by this time and this time and this time. And then in a year from now, I wanted this. And I've started doing all those things and they've been successful. And That's awesome. some haven't, of course. I mean, some have been successful, which was unsuccessful because if you're doing a negative thing and that's successful, it's kind of not successful to your life. It's a weird concept. <laughs> right, but, right, right. But I just kind of started distancing myself from people like that because it's kind of, um, it's not a good mindset to have. Because like you said, you were like, I had the, my journey written. Like, I admire that. Because that means that you s sat down and you were like, wow, what do I want? What am I trying to get to? What, are, what what do I even want my life to look like? Like, I might be dead tomorrow, but if I'm not, what do I want it to look like? And I feel like people don't think that way, man. 
people that's what this channel is all about is getting people to think that way that hello like one two three four and we're in the future and whatever i was just saying is in the past and it's gonna keep going and it's all happening now what are you doing yeah because people have this idea that oh yeah i'll just you know get, get that job later i'll start the podcast later yeah. i'll talk to that girl later that girl probably has like 30 guys in her dms number one number two it's almost gonna steal your business idea if you don't hop on it number three you know just get to it i feel yeah. like i you know i feel like people aren't getting to it yeah yeah and that's kind of the thing i think my underlying passion and like where my heart's desire has been the whole time is like just with the arts bro like i've always been about music and i say about music i say i write music i rap uh i don't make beats unfortunately i do know people who make beats so that helps but like in the midst of me doing all this stuff that society approves of being in student government, like society loves that shit. Like that's where you want to be. You want to be in the student government because that's respected. My grandma liked that shit. It's hard for me to do something my grandmother likes. So <laughs> the fact that I could, you know, make her happy, I think that was like subconsciously a huge motivator for me. And I didn't realize it. Like I just liked making her happy. I liked making her proud of me. Because up to that point, she wasn't very proud and she was pretty disappointed in like, you know, my grandson, he's making me look bad. It's like, yeah. he's a reflection of my son that I raised. That yeah. raised him, you it's know. that old school mindset. Yeah, and it goes down that path. And and like if you allow people like that to be strong influencers in your life, then I think you can end up, and I think that's what happens with a lot of people. They end up going down a path that like makes them miserable. They're 45 or 40 or 35, whatever the case may be, and they realize they're not fucking happy, they're not satisfied, and they don't know how the fuck to get out of it because they're so deep into the fucking hole they've dug. And so, like, when it comes to not doing law school and, and moving more into the creative, artistic realm, as in making a podcast, uh, you know, I don't write as much music, but it's still, this is an avenue for me to express myself. And this is what I love to do. Like having a conversation with new people or people that I already know, just having conversations. And then like all the, the back work, you know, a podcast is obviously, it's more than just a conversation. Oh God. Like, you know, there's production that goes into it. There's editing, there's publishing and like there's coordination to even get the interview to happen. There's so much structure that's involved to really make it happen that you can like, I feel like this has allowed me to combine the two, right? There's, I can combine the structure that society wants from us. And I can also combine the art and the creative nature that I feel like we all like I, th I just believe we're all artists at the end of the day. And if we haven't figured out what our art is or how to express ourselves through some form of art, then we're just lost. And that's the problem. People, and you know, if you go to academia and you start talking about art, like you're going to get laughed out of the fucking room unless of course you're an art major, right? But if you're in anything other than like an art major, uh, nobody respects that. They think, oh, well, that's a real fucking way to get no job. I think being an art major is a real way to get no job. I know three people that are... That's what I just said. Yeah, exactly. Uh oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, I'm re reinstating your point. Well, that yeah, that's what people think. But I, I think that mindset is bullshit because it leads people like me who, you know, at the end of the day, one of those complexes of being human is I want to be accepted. I want to be loved. I want to be appreciated. I want to be respected. And it's like, you know, I guess that's the ego, right? That's the, the self, the pride, all that shit comes into play when we talk about how we fit in. And so me hearing that enough times, I'm like, mm, yeah, I don't want to be an art major, even though I love fucking art. Like I, I just sat here and went on about like, all I wanted to do is make music. Like, even when, when I dropped out of high school, I was making music. Why was I not going to school? Uh, partially because 
my mom was gone to work and it was like my responsibility to get myself to school, but also partially because I had the decision. It was left up to me, obviously, but I did have a microphone. I had a computer. I could make music at the house. So I'd find myself in this tug of war, make a song, go to school, work on this song, go to school. And it was always easy for me. Well, it wasn't easy because I had the tug from what I, I felt like society wanted. and But I always chose art every time. So I fucking love art. Shout out to the artists in the world. Shout out to the art majors. We respect you. We love you. See, I respect I respect art majors. I respect a lot of people who get out there and pursue something. But I think art is exactly what you just said. You you got out there and did it. You know? Right. You made it, you created something. I feel like people try to sell art and that's bullshit. Like you're not an artist until you get this degree. Until yeah. you sit through these classes and you get really good at looking up all the answers online and figuring out how to fucking cram shit in the night before for a test and dumping on it's not until you do all that. It's not until you do that that you're an artist. I think it's bullshit because I know three people that graduated as art majors and they're working at like Sam's Club or working at and they got bachelor's degrees in art from Art Institute of Atlanta, not SCAD, but Art Institute of Atlanta. Yeah, pretty much all art instit- all, uh, all of them. <laughs> all of them were from the Art Institute of Atlanta. I don't know if they're tripping or what it is, but I just feel like you can't teach art. I feel like you, you, you do exactly what you just said. You can get better at it, but I don't think you need an art degree to be an artist. Well, I think it just depends. Like Now, an art degree, that's... I guess that's pretty broad, so I don't know like what specifically those fashion are. fashion marketing and one of them was music production. Okay. And both so, of those people were unable to to like both of them not only didn't feel like they had the skills to get a job, but they didn't know what to do. And now they're just working random jobs. So now I'm actually I've changed my major again. We've done it again, guys. I am now a I'm I'm a media entrepreneurship major, which is uh, apparently booming. At Georgia State, it's the the number one uh, growing major at the school, which I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Maybe I'm like, I feel like it's always better to be early rather than on time. So I feel like I'm on time, but it could it would have been cool if I was early. Regardless, the point to this is, I feel like what I'm studying now is going hand in hand with my hobby exactly like that's the thing where if if those people who were studying fashion or music production if they're not doing fashion related like if they're not making clothes on the side anyways exactly if they're not producing music anyways before they were ever learning about it it's not gonna fucking work exactly there's no damn way because like those skills take a long time to develop and it's not gonna happen in four years of, you can't think that, like the best philosophy students that I met, they like there's so much you have to do outside of the classroom, and the ones who were really good at it, they enjoyed it, they weren't forcing shit, like I would say, what do you do? Like do you just set goals and you just read? He's like, no, I just I just love it, I just love this stuff, and so I th- and part of that like influenced me as well I think to to really check myself and say. Am I doing all this for credentials and uh, to to boost my credibility, or am I doing it because like I have a passion for it and I love it? I think I ha- I have a passion for people accepting me and I love when people accept me and they respect me. But does that mean that I have a passion for it and a love for philosophy or? you know even being a lawyer maybe not and like i it's clear to me now like i just i i love what the fuck i'm doing right and i've lo- i've always loved making music so if that shit's not there before uh you start getting formally educated on the topic then you like you just can't expect it to to really result in anything fruitful i don't think yeah 
Boom, and we're done. <laughs> Shit, man. Believe it or not, we've been going for about an hour. Yeah, that's yeah. We better stop it now. So, hey, man, how can people get to your channel? How how can people get in touch with you? What are, you want? Want to shout out your Instagram? Shout out any any type of page that they can get involved with you. Of course, other than the YouTube channel, which will be linked in the description. But how yeah. can people get in touch with you? Oh man, uh, my phone number is seven seven zero. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, holy shit. <laughs> no, but I mean, literally. Obviously, if you're watching this, you're probably cool with uh, Charmel. So, oh, yeah. Charbel. Oh yeah. Fuck. Nah, who gives Sorry, a shit? bro. Nah, I'm a fucking dude. idiot. Okay. I've gotten I've gotten sh Shablash, sh sh Carbell, Charbel, dude. I don't give a shit. <laughs> anyway, keep going. <laughs> yeah. So obviously on YouTube, Inspire Distraction. That's the fucking channel. We're still working out the kinks, figuring out what's what. Instagram at Inspire Distraction. Uh, that's about it f for now. Oh yeah. But just fucking, you know, keep your eyes peeled. Stay tuned, cause we're about to hop on there right now. Yeah, we're about to, and I don't know if you want to go live or not. Um, Let's do it. But we'll fucking we'll check some shit out. We'll do some shit. Bet. Hey. Well, hey man, I'm Shar Belmalan. Today we got Doctor Distracted, and this has been a time shared. Thank you so much.